I V M. On February 1st of 2021, a physical education teacher in Naipidao went about her morning aerobics workout at a picturesque spot near the parliament. What she didn't know as she danced was that history was being made right behind her as armored vehicles and black SUVs swept by on the Royal Lotus Roundabout near the country's parliament. This was the Myanmar military seizing control of the country in the early hours of the morning, detaining Aung San Suu Kyi and other top officials in her party, the National League of Democracy. Welcome to States of Anarchy, a podcast on global affairs and foreign policy. I'm your host, Hamsani Hariharan. Every week on the show, I tackle issues in global affairs and foreign policy, all in the hope of making a little more sense of the world around us. In the last month, Myanmar has seen protests, violence and conflict since the Tatmadaw or the Myanmar Armed Forces have ousted the National League of Democracy or the NLD. Myanmar's young population has come out on the streets to protest against the curtailing of democracy. There are important questions to answer about the coup. Why now? What does this mean for Suu Kyi and the future of Myanmar? These are not easy questions to answer and the situation is evolving every day. So on today's show, I have not one but two guests who are going to break things down for me. My first guest, Pratap Heblikar, is the managing trustee of the Institute of Contemporary Studies, Bengaluru. He retired as the special secretary of the Indian government in 2010, after more than 38 years of service in the Indian intelligence. My second guest for today is Bert Lintner, who's been covering Asian politics for the past four decades. He's written about 17 books on Asian politics and history, and a good many of them are about Myanmar. Our episode for today is a punchy, power-packed one, and we're going to get to the conversation after a really quick break to hear from the good folks at IVM Podcasts. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week, Siet Tires and The Whole Truth Foods. We really appreciate your support. So, on Cyrus Says, Sagarika Ghost, journalist, columnist, author, discusses the book she has written, her experiences from reporting about the Babri Masjid demolition back in the day, and the upcoming state election. Cyrus also had a great episode with Devdat Patnayak last week. Do check that out. Chuck narrates an interesting story about a company that shared its virtual expertise with other companies and empowered the virtual world. No, we're not going to tell you what the brand is, but go check out The Origin of Things. And Chuck also came back on Simplified this week from episode 200 onwards. He's back. Go check that out if you haven't had a chance to do so so far. The Habit Coach Ashton was joined by Sapna Gopal Krishnan, his core trekker on Mount Kilimanjaro. They recollect the trek's memories and Sapna talks about the challenges she faced. On all things policy, Rachid Chet talks to Sarthak Pradhan about Delhi's water crisis. This is due to the pollution of his major water source, the River Yamuna, and he discusses the case against the state of Haryana. We had Manish Dangi, Chief Investment Officer of the Aditya Birla Sun Life Mutual Fund on Pesa Vesa with Anupam Gupta. They discussed India's financial report card with reference to the past decade, the hits and misses, and what the future of investing is going to look like. And with that, let me get you back to your show. Welcome back to States of Anarchy. I'm your host, Hamsani Hariharan. And I'm sitting down with Bertil Lintner and Pratap Heblikar. We start off with discussing why the military coup in Myanmar took place last month. The main question is here, why did they do it? Why did the military seize power when they they already were the most powerful institution in the country? An institution that could veto any kind of attempts to change the constitution, for instance. And I think the answer there is that the military feared that uh, with NLD's massive electoral victory, they were pushing for those changes, which would reduce the power of the military, naturally. And I think in the beginning, the, immediately after the election, uh, I think the military had actually tried to reach out to the NLD to reach some kind of accommodation to preserve their privileges. The NLD was only moderately interested in that. They thought that with their massive support behind them, they would be able to rule the country and implement those changes. But they didn't happen. And if you go back to January, really, it was the first time a, a military spokesman said that there might be a coup. And I mean, nobody took it seriously. But I think they started planning for this, for the takeover on the 1st of February, at about that time, maybe even before that. And uh, they started scouting for people who could be possible ministers and advisors and that sort of thing. Because once they staged the coup, 
it's clear that everything we had was been very carefully prepared. It was not as knee-jerk reaction to something the NLD had said in the last minute, where some people have claimed it can't be. It was too, you know, executed in a meticulously planned way. And uh, what they had not expected, though, was his massive reaction against it. They had misjudged that completely. Instead of, uh, you know, being people sort of accepting what had happened, and maybe a few protests here and there, the whole country rose up. Millions of people marching in every town, every city, across the country from the north to the south. And uh, it is clear, I think, that what is different this time from 1988 to a somewhat similar uprising is that now we have a whole generation of young people in Myanmar who have actually grown up in a fairly open liberal political social environment. Because that is what the military did when they, after they formed, they formed their elect, uh, government in 2012, uh, 2011, rather, and the election was in 2010. Because I mean, in 2008, they had uh, enacted and implemented a new um, constitution, which would guarantee the military's hold on power, no matter who sat in, in the ministries in, in, in Ipido. But, and then it came the, 19, uh, the 2010 election, which, of course, the military party won because it was boycotted by NLD, and there was not a free and fair election. But then came uh, 2015, uh, first actually the by-election in 2012, when Aung San Suu Kyi was elected to parliament. And uh, this was something that we well, were not really pleased with. This is not what they had expected. And then, of course, came uh, the uprising, which we've seen since the 1st of February. And after the 2011 election, it did permit a large degree of, you know, personal freedom, press freedom, you know, freedom of expression, political parties were allowed to open it for the first time since, you know, well, since uh, 1960, 62, the early 60s. And uh, then you have this new generation, which it got used to this. And one mustn't forget, they're very com computer savvy. Probably better attending computers than the generals themselves. So in this way, as soon as demonstrations began, news was spread all over the country and more and more people joined in. There was not one atrocity that the police or the military committed that was not recorded and broadcast over social media. They named and shamed everyone. And that, of course, prompted the military to intervene more forcefully. And that's what we are seeing now. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hebliker, do you agree? Do you think that this was planned for a while? And do you think that this was over insecurities within the Myanmar military? I I think what um, Bertil has done is given us a factual uh, picture of what happened and the way we are at this point of time. Yes, I think um, the elections of November 8, 2020 had all the trappings that uh, the military would intervene because uh, statements by the powerful military commander and his uh, statements in the post-election period, uh, they still had uh, increased. I think they were uh, the, the shouting match between the civilian power center and the military had uh, risen to the next level. So I think as far as I, I looked at it, uh, it was a question of time and the military would uh, step in and take power. And to me, the date of February 1st was very obvious that when the military has cried foul, cried saying that fraudulent election has been imposed on the country, and would it allow, despite all this shouting, a parliament to be convened? Had the parliament been convened on the 1st of uh, February this year, it would have negated the entire lot of the military's complaints. Between the members taking oath as uh, members of parliament and the new uh, cabinet being sworn four to six weeks later, would I have given the military less of space to operate? I think uh, the um, despite two meetings that were held between NLD and the military, I think they did not find common ground. The military was adamant that it was a rigged election and the NLD was not willing to see its space. 
So I think that is the context. And if you look back the uh, right from the time the military assumed power, right from the late 50s, beginning in 66, when Navy actually ousted uh, UNU, uh, I think it has been a saga. And the military has never found itself to be a popular institution speaking in purely electoral terms. It can never win an election on its own. It was demonstrated in 1990. It was demonstrated in uh, uh, 2015 that it is not capable. And it has to create conditions suitable for itself to win the elections. So having arrived on the 1st of February 2021, the military has now inaugurated a new scenario for Myanmar and for which we don't know whether it is still in the cul-de-sac or how it is going to emerge. I think to that extent, the people who are now the purveyors of power in Myanmar have seen the transition from senior from Kenyon, uh, stewardship of the National Intelligence Service to Tanshwe handing over power and the demise of the, uh, shall we say, the Navin family. The guys who are in power today have seen it all. In fact, I think some of them uh, did um, look at the Saffron Revolution, which took place in 2007. And they are pretty much accustomed or used to uh, uh, the kind of action the military takes. I have seen it personally when I was posted in Myanmar. It's not something new that uh, happened in the past. But there are two things which I would like to underline in you know, thick black ink is what Bert Hill said, that the younger generation of today, after having tasted the fruits of democracy for five, 10 years, have learned a lot. And they do not want to give away those fruits of freedom so easily. And secondly, the situation today with the development of social media has now stretched the government's imagination to the extent possible. What you see happening in Rangoon last night, now all over the world today, compare this to what happened in 1988 or 1990, or thereafter from 1990 to 2010. It is a whole new world. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you go to this young generation, computer survey, disseminating information all over the world in no time at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, 88 was a much bloodier event. At that time, thousands of people were killed in interventions by the military, first in the, after August uh, the 8th, and then after September the 18th. But the only pictures we got from that time was, were smuggled out by some photographers in you know, rolls of film. They managed to smuggle them out to Thailand, and there was there were only about four or five, not more than ten images left from that area, era, which shows how serious it actually was. Mm -hmm. This time we have two hundred people die have died there so far. So there are few. It sounds very cynical to say this, but there are not not as many people have died yet. We don't know yet what's going to happen because it is brutal what's happening. Mm -hmm. But now we're living in a different era and different world from 1988, so it's much more difficult for the generals to get away with what they do and what they have done. Uh, Mr. Hayblicker, you wanted to underline two things uh, in thick black ink. I think the first one you said was the younger population, and I couldn't catch the second one. Um, the second one, I was talking on the, the power and the role of social media. Mm -hmm. uh, and. It has, you know, I think as at the time of the elections, in my article, I said social media penetration of the civic society in Myanmar was about 40 to 50 percent. It was a good increase of about 20 odd percent since uh, the previous election in 2015. And I think, secondly, I think uh, 80 to 90 percent of the uh, Burmese population is well read. The number of tabloids that are there in this country is something which is very interesting to look at. So the people are well read. And uh, the uh, way the communication is done between themselves is uh, very fast. Plus, there is a lot of input that is happening uh, overseas. I keep getting photographs of the violence in Rangoon, in Mandalay, in, in Dawei, and those places. So it means that despite whatever checks and balances that the government would be putting in. There are methods by which uh, this thing has been sidestepped and the international community is being you know, told as to what is happening. 
Two days ago, I heard U Onzo, who is the editor of the the Iravadi, and he spoke about the power of uh, social media. And I don't think for a man who still operates uh, his newspaper on a daily basis, with his reporters in Rangoon and other places, hats off to him. I think he's doing a tremendous job. There are many others who have been trying to tell us what is happening without social media and the kind of information that is coming out. It would be difficult for people, you know, elsewhere to assess or put things into perspective. There are other things that never happened in the past. For example, um, demonstrations in front of the Chinese embassy. There were demonstrations in front of the Indonesian embassy. And demonstration in front of the Chinese embassy is uh, a new product of this agitation. And uh, it has taken uh, the Chinese are quite upset that demonstrations did take place in front of the embassy. Now, the burning of Chinese property in Rangoon uh, is not a new development. It's happened in the past, happened in 1968, where uh, a number of Chinese nationals were killed, their businesses were uh, destroyed. But I think uh, it's not a good sign. The anger, the palpable anger of, against the Chinese uh, is not hidden in Myanmar. But I think these are expressions that uh, may become louder uh, as the weeks go by if uh, there is no council coming in. To what I have observed in my posting in Myanmar, I always thought that once the military was either overstepping its uh, limits, that a Chinese senior party functionary would arrive in Rangoon and counsel patients and no mature advice. It happened in 1997-98, but there were anti-Muslim riots in Rangoon. When a Chinese state councillor came to meet the Tanshwe and his cohorts, and advise them to ensure that they don't you know, go beyond a point. We don't know whether uh, Foreign Minister Wangi's visit was in that direction when he came on the 20th of January, 10 days ahead of the coup. Uh, what transpired between them is unknown. But what somebody says that the Chinese also came quite anxious to avoid problems. And uh, whether uh, they were able to counsel the military in Success is not known, but the coup did take place. So there are a lot of new uh, pictures on the horizon that uh, we are seeing which didn't happen in the past. Yes, I think on the point on social media, it's uh, interesting to see what internet shutdowns are going to do to the protests and how they're going to affect it. I think one important point is that um, the people who are protesting in Myanmar have also seen how the protests have unfolded in Thailand have seen how the protests have unfolded in Hong Kong. And so they're taking learnings from elsewhere also into the protests. And I'm glad that you brought up China because an important point that I was looking through was one of the fears that the Myanmar military had about over-dependence on China. So how would the both of you react to that? I'll first leave it to Bertil because uh, he has been the author of a remarkable report that told us of what was the transition that took place in 2004 to 2006. So I leave it to him and I will try and add my bits to it if necessary. Well, uh, this true that there were anti-Chinese riots and riots in Rangoon Chinatown in 1967. But those were against local Chinese, Sino-Burmese, who were at that time controlling the black market. And the government, there was an economic crisis, the government found it very convenient to blame it on the, on the Sino-Burmese. This time, is it against mainland Chinese investment and Chinese domination? And this goes back to that the myths on hydroelectric power scheme in the far north, the Padang copper mine, the raping of Myanmar's uh, forest resources, mineral resources. China is being seen and perceived as a very oppressive power. And uh, that is something new. I mean, I don't think China has encountered this anywhere else. And we can also see how the local China Burmese community have reacted to this. They have come out in, for, in support of the demonstrations. Uh, if you know, the, you've seen this iconic picture of the young girl who was uh, shot in Mandalay, Angel, as she was called. She was Chinese, a Chinese from Mandalay. Uh, a 17 year old uh, Burmese boy was shot also in Mandalay. And his mother uh, appeared on social media, explained, yes, we are Chinese, but we are not supporters of the government in Beijing. We are living here because we do not want under that kind of repression. But you see, the fear was there. And uh, 
the sino Burmese community was anxious to make sure they did not become scapegoats once again. And I don't think that's going to happen because there are too many sino Burmese involved there already. Then we have the dependence on China. Well, after 88, various sanctions were imposed and boycotts one after the other. And Myanmar became heavily dependent on China for everything, for trade, supply of weapons, diplomatic support in the United Nations to block any terms for the Security Council to take action. And it came to a point where I think the fiercely nationalistic army, and we have to remember that whatever we may think about them, they are very nationalistic. They see themselves as guardians of the nation, sovereignty, and that sort of thing. I came across some classified information, documents, compiled by the Myanmar military in uh, 2004, as early as that, where they went through their relations with China and said that our sovereignty is in danger. We're in danger of losing our sovereignty to the Chinese. We have to open up ourselves to the West, India was mentioned as well, and the rest of the outside world in order to counter China's influence. And then came the suggestions, and that is basically what has happened after 2010, that election. It was still a plan, there was, I would call it a master plan that was put in, into action. And it worked. And you see how you know, Hillary Clinton went there, and Obama came twice. Suddenly, Myanmar turned from being the pariah of the Western world to be the darling of the Western world. But they, again, that changed after the Rohingya crisis in 2017 but the West turned their backs on China once again, and the Chinese were back with a vengeance. So, I mean, they were really trying to restore the influence they had lost after 2010, and they have actually succeeded in doing that. But we have to remember that the commander in chief, you know, Minang Lang, is not pro-Chinese at all. I mean, when he became the commander in chief, the first country he went on a visit, he visited was Vietnam. So you can imagine what they were talking about. <laughs> but, uh, Today, you know, they have no choice, really. And uh, they, they must have anticipated what the reaction from the outside world, minus China and Russia, would be. And if you look at the composition of, of the government, Wuna Mongluen, the new foreign minister, is fierce, a very pro-Chinese, anti-West. Uh, Koko Lang, the minister of foreign investment, the same thing. He is even part of some Chinese think tanks. So they were actually putting all those people in place before they launched the coup. So just to make sure that the relation with China would not be affected or even may have perhaps improve after the coup. But they knew that the rest of the world would, would condemn what, what was happening. But the question is, where do they take it from here? Would they allow themselves to be totally dependent on China once again? Well, this is one of the big questions mark, question marks that hangs over Myanmar today. We don't know yet. And uh, we don't even know what they have in mind when it, when it comes to foreign relations. They hired a PR firm, but that's a complete waste of money. I mean, Arab and Manashi is not going to help them improve the, the image internationally. <laughs> I mean, he's a notorious uh, guy who represents, who has represented dictators all over the world in the past. It was probably going to be counterproductive. But again, that shows how behind the military are when it comes to social media, when it comes to understanding the world outside their own you know, boundaries. They're way behind these younger people, and they are smart. But I taught uh, investigative journalism in Yangon and Mandalay and Mulmin for several years now, not before the coup, actually, before the pandemic, after that on, on Zoom. And I've been impressed. These are young people who, who, who what, they were born under military rule, but they're very professional. And they really, they're excellent journalists. They're eager to, to do their job. But of course, and that's one of the reasons why journalists have been targeted right now. I think about 38 journalists have been arrested. Some of them have been charged, and some of them have just disappeared. Because they see the, these young journalists as a threat to this, the order they have established. So, I mean, there are certain hopes here for the future, and that is with the young generation. Whether they, they will get any chance or not, that is very, very difficult to say. But they're asking for the international community to come and intervene, for the, you know, the R2P and that sort of thing, the UN Security Council. And I see these appeals, I feel sad because I know that that is not going to happen. The only country that could possibly intervene in, China, in the Myanmar today is China. If China sees its economic interests threatened by Myanmar becoming a failed state, they may intervene 
it's very likely they will intervene in one way or another. Exactly what shape they will take, we don't know yet. Mr. Hevlicker, do you agree? Yes, I think uh, I look at it from two points of view. One is the um, what happened when the, the younger generation in the Myanmar military decided that it was time had come to diversify away from China to reduce Chinese influence in the political governance of Myanmar to the extent and to look at other possible destinations as um, alternatives. I think it was a golden opportunity that came our way. And I think right from that time on, from 2008 onwards, when you had a, a default constitution in place, which allowed the military 25% uh, of the parliamentary seats to be filled from within its ranks. I think uh, what the... Uh, the fledgling democracy came about in 2011 to 2020. I think uh, the uh, the Western nations should have taken this to be a an opportunity which was coming their way to seize it by both hands. I have always argued that uh, Western sanctions represent a colonial baggage. It has been applied elsewhere where the, Brit the British did it, uh, the Ian Smith's government in Rhodesia in the 60s. Uh, nothing has actually happened. In fact, it has led to greater dependence on Myanmar's northern neighbor for many reasons. So I think the West, by virtue of uh, its so-called championship of human rights and things like this threw Myanmar before the bus. They didn't allow this fledgling democracy to gain traction. And by right from 2011 to 2015, if they had focused more on bringing things to Myanmar, why did not the West engage with the Myanmar military? I think the, the military must also be harboring a thought that you'd like to go back to the barracks with its reputation and honor intact without the fear of being prosecuted for what happened in the past. That would be one way of looking at it. Secondly, uh, over the Rohingya issue, I don't know how many Western countries understand what exactly the issue is all about. And that means the Rohingya issue needs a very, very clear understanding before you begin to think of it. There are two things uh, in Myanmar's um, political calendar today that have remained unresolved. One is the ceasefire with the national ethnic organizations and the Rohingya issue. I'm saying if you look at the map of Myanmar, it resembles a horseshoe. You have uh, ethnic minority states on the horseshoe, and in the middle you have the Burmese majority areas. Then the open end uh, enters, you know, empties into the Bay of Bengal. So you need to understand so how accommodation would have been made between the ethnic states and the Bamar majority, uh, you know, uh, platforms in the country. Secondly, what is the Rohingya issue? Why has it not received adequate international attention? It's an emotive issue. It's an issue which has divided the country on, you know, Muslims in Rangoon may not have the same problems that the Rohingyas in Arakan state. Now, for example, you have a hundred, uh, a million plus in a neighboring country sheltering there. What is it that we are trying to do? What do the Western countries want uh, Myanmar to do or Bangladesh to do? Even if those million people come back to uh, Myanmar, are they going to get their political rights? Are they going to be treated as citizens? Is anybody going to assure them that economic development will happen as happens in the other states? No. The Rohingya issue requires a political settlement within the constitution of Myanmar. The only agency or organization that is capable, I use the word capable, of addressing this is the Myanmar military. Because Aung San Suu Kyi, during her time when she was in incarceration and out of it, she was like an auditor and accountant general. And she was there to tell the military, you can do this, you cannot do this. A portion of the blame for what the mess the country finds itself can be at her door. 
One of the more combination between NLD and the military prior to the coup taking place. There were no opportunities. So anyway, land well, uh, there to be a time happening. But unless you deal with these issues, uh, the uh, ceasefire between the ethnic organizations, as I told you, is a horseshoe. You have the Chins, yeah, and you have the Kachins, you have the Shahs, the Karen, the Kaini, who are major parties to uh, the ceasefire you know, agreements in place. And now, um, if this is not moved in the last five years, uh, there is something wrong. Clashes continue to take place in these areas between the military and the armed organizations. So what I'm saying is, yes, uh, we'll just go back to uh, the way we look at it. Unless uh, there is a consensus in the country, there is an element of rapprochement and reconciliation. Myanmar is going to remain a single party state, a military party state. And I think the political opportunities are going to become narrow. For example, after all we have seen in the last six weeks, which is happening in Myanmar, I would not think that the military would ever want to say that, look, I'm going to hold elections next year in January. So what happen? So it's a pipe dream if anybody thinks that me online is going to have an election in the next 12 months, it's not going to happen. I think there's a greater responsibility devolves on the Western world or the neighboring countries to bring about some kind of an understanding that is, the military must be brought around to the fact that uh, you have to look at the future. How you run is a very simplistic statement to make, but I think uh, somebody is missing the woods for the trees here. Right? You cannot, you know, uh, the Oxford students, you know, removes Aung San Suu Kyi's portrait from the hall because he could not do anything in the Rohingya. Or the European Union says that, look, she's not done her work, so she's not our favorite child anymore. You have weakened an icon of democracy in this country. You were responsible for it. You didn't punish anybody else. You took on the only target available to you. People were not the extent of taking a Nobel Prize away. They have no right. So what I'm saying is, as, yes, we have come to a stage where uh, you need to look at how you're going to bring things to a, uh, a conclusion by preventing further bloodshed, preventing the country from getting into a civil war situation. Because I think there are a lot of weapons that will be floating around in the countryside today where there are huge targets available. So this is that. I think what I'm saying is that the uh, way uh, Myanmar has now come to construct itself with a Chinese umbrella in one hand, with all the money coming in, the Chinese are very, very shrewd as uh, Bertil said, they're very smart. They have about you know, all told $17 billion worth of investment in that country. They're building a, a Irrawaddy transit corridor from the Yunnan province to Bay of Bengal to you know, save themselves from going to the South China Seas or into the Malacca Straits. Now they have a pipeline which carries gas and oil from the South to the North. They don't want to throw everything away. So the Chinese have a vested interest. They will ensure that things don't go out of control perhaps. But it is worrisome. Prolonged Chinese hand on uh, the reins of power is going to be very, very problematic. I think I have a couple of thoughts. One is that I think there's an interesting dichotomy if you want to sort of diversify relations with countries across the world. But a coup would obviously mean even more international isolation is what I think at least. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily serve your purpose. Um, on the other hand, uh, I'd like to get to the ceasefire, but I don't know if this is rather naive of me and I'd like one of you to uh, answer this. Is how, how What does the Rohingya refugee crisis have to do with the... Is there a link between the crisis and the Myanmar military taking over today? Because apart from bringing perhaps international pressure, um, is there a problem that the military needs to address? To answer your question, I would say no. I don't think the Rohingya question has anything to do with that. It's a completely different issue. And we must remember that, I mean, there's a very large Muslim minority in Myanmar. It's been there for, you know, forever. And uh, more came uh, during the British colonial times, mainly from India. What is happening in Rakhine, what happened in Rakhine State is not primarily an anti-Muslim issue. Remember that Aung San Suu Kyi's chief legal advisor, Ukoni, was a Muslim. 
His father was an immigrant from Lucknow. His mother was Burmese. And uh, you have other Muslims who played important roles in, in Burmese uh, politics. If you go down Sula Pagoda Road in, uh, in Yangon, where all the mobile phone sellers are, most of them are of Indian origin. And they are very eager to point out that they are not Rohingyas. You know, don't get us mixed up with them. The Rohingyas are different. They are a rural population who speak a different, completely different language. And they speak the Chilagonian dialect of, of Bengali with some loan words from Arakanese or, or Burmese. And they were not really an, an ethnic community until very recently. Throughout the British time, they were called Chilagonian. I mean, they've been Muslims, they've been in Rakhine since the 17th century, that's correct. But the big influx came during uh, the colonial era when labor was uh, needed for the rice industry, for road construction, that sort of thing. And uh, the Bengalis were, were considered much better at that than these hopeless Rakhine who were, only went to temples all the time. So it is a different issue from other ethnic minority issues in, in, the, in the country. And I think, don't think the West have understood that. Why are the Rohingyas treated differently? Of course, they're not justifying what was done to them. But there is a reason why it happened that way. It is different from the ethnic wars in Shan State or Kachin State and so on. But before we go on, let me give you two quotes. One about Aung San Suu Kyi. Back in the 1990s, an Indian thinker, I will not say who that was, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, admires Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi is a big role model besides Martin Luther King. But the difference between Mahatma Gandhi and Aung San Suu Kyi is that Mahatma Gandhi was a saint, but also an extremely shrewd politician. Aung San Suu Kyi is a saint. <laughs> but she lacks the political skills to deal with the military, to deal with even her own co-workers in the party. One after another, he left you know, under a cloud and he had a falling out with many of them. And the other quote I would like to give you is uh, from the last, it was done in public, so I can mention the name, the last American ambassador to Myanmar before the downgraded diplomatic relations. He was there during 1988. His name was Bertrand Lewin. And he gave a talk at the Asia Foundation, I think he was in D.C. or New York, where he said that, very frank, he said, it was very frank, he said, but in Burma, he said, we don't have any strategic, economic, or political interests. So therefore, we have the luxury of that of being able to live up to our principles. <laughs> but uh, that is, of course, changed, because not the United States does have strategic interests in Myanmar because of the China factor. And uh, I will agree here that the West has mishandled this situation completely. And I don't think even if the turn around now and try to engage whatever that means, the Myanmar military, they, will, they won't listen to them. Uh, it's easier to take the moral high ground. It's much more difficult to face political realities on the ground, even if they may be very unpleasant. And as I see it, there's only two countries in the region who could possibly fill that role. There will be India and Japan, not the West. Uh, Japan, as you know, is very active. We they see the Chinese threat, you know, as they see it. And they have a special envoy, Yui Sasakawa, who is, was all over the place trying to mediate and, between different factions and try to get them away from dependence on China. Uh, India has not played as big a role as I think that many people would have wanted. Because, I mean, as an outsider, I can say, you're too occupied with your western border. <laughs> Pay a little more attention to the eastern border as well, because that's where you have opportunities. That's where this is the trade routes to Southeast Asia, uh, the cross-border insurgency, so it's a strategic interest. And uh, you have a lot of refugees who have come into to India for, in, in various stages of you know, in modern history and so on. And uh, there's much more potential for some kind of things changing in the future there than on the Western border where I can't see anything changing at all. But as I said, I'd like to emphasize that and again, it's India and Japan that can play a constructive role here. The West, can, yes, they can issue statements, they can do whatever they want. It's nice to be on the, take the more high ground, but it's not going to change anything. Mr. Hevlikar, as the insider on the issue, what do you think uh, of the Indian role? No, I would like to endorse what Bertil has said. I think uh, we are on the same page as far as um, relationship with uh, Myanmar is concerned. I just like to give a little bit of perspective. Uh, right from, you know, 19... 
1988 to 1990 was one of the most uh, trying periods in india's uh, strategic uh, you know activities uh, we had operation brass tacks with pakistan you had operation chakar board with china you had uh, the indian army operating in sri lanka uh, in uh, uh, to help uh, bring the ltt around then you had um, problems with bangladesh and uh, nepal plus india was pushing to um, bring multi party democracy into burma at that point of time and people in burma still remember how all india radio was even more loyal than the king and it was even much uh, more active than the voice of america or the bbc so right from 1990 to uh, 2010 for 20 long years uh, india's relationship with uh, myanmar was subject to a lot of uh, trust deficit it is not that india shied away from its commitments political or otherwise to that country in fact in 1997 india became one of the very few countries in the world to give myanmar a 10 million dollar line of credit in april of that year president clinton announced further uh, sanctions on myanmar and that year we held a international exhibition in rangoon so wherever commitments are required india has been uh, doing it but i think uh, at that point of time in those 20 years uh, myanmar trust uh, levels had gone down uh, myanmar had become the ground for growing chinese influence which looked at india as a adversary and then growing pakistani machinations against india this was combined with again hostile governments in dhaka so india had two neighbors who had given sanctuary to powers inimical to it so at that point of time we were trying to ensure that our northeastern region remained uh, stable secure from insurgencies that were being fueled from across the borders If you come to uh, Bangladesh, uh, Sheikh Hasina was the one who actually took the danda in a hand, the stick in the hand, and brought the Indian insurgents to heel. She arrested most of its leadership and handed them over to India. And there was a quid pro quo. That's how she broke the back of the Indian insurgency. That's how she brought fundamentalism under check in uh, Bangladesh. And she also arrested Pakistani machinations in that country. At the same time, India's relationship. during the last few years of general transvay's rule had also improved, improved to a large extent so i think we need to look at it from that point of view that yes india has a vested interest in myanmar it was in uh, early 90s mid 90s that the prime minister narasimha rao decided that he would inaugurate the look east policy it was india's attempt to catch up on the missing bus when we did not join the asean in 67 when it was formed and as you have realized that you know india's economic future lies with countries to its east rather than to its west at this point of time so i think when this government came to office in 2014 the uh, lukis policy became an actis policy because it had all the strategic ingredients in into it so india's interest in myanmar is much more than what i think is happening today i think this government i'm not saying that from a political perspective from a national strategic perspective india's interests and objectives are being well looked after by this country in myanmar today what i'm saying is we don't have to compete with the chinese we are not in that league but where you can try and strengthen yourself by your natural uh, you know abilities india is doing it i'm sure uh, of course i understand that uh, the developments in myanmar were discussed between prime minister modi and uh, president biden and a few other leaders as bertrand rightly puts it india is one very strong contender which has got acceptance both with the military and the civil leadership of course there isn't any civil leadership but people would still correspond to a second you know uh, sounding base in japan of course looks japan has got tremendous uh, influence in uh, in myanmar in fact uh, uh, the gentleman uh, whom bertrand sasakawa had toured rakhine state 
she has developed plans for uh, improving the condition there. Japan is willing to put, uh, you know, go back to its checkbook diplomacy. These two countries, and look at the uh, thing, both countries are members of the Quad. Both have, uh, India has a better understanding of what's happening in our neighborhood than people who are not present here. And I think uh, India's today, India's credentials are stronger because even the international community comes to accept that India could play a role in Myanmar. And India has been playing a role in the UN to ensure that uh, there is equanimity in how we would deal with the situation. India, so now on the 27th or 28th of this month, the BIMSTEC foreign ministers meet in Colombo. And there's going to be uh, their first meeting with the uh, uh, Myanmar uh, foreign minister. And we need to see how the whole thing pans out. Between then, the Prime Minister of India is going to be in Bangladesh. He's certainly going to exchange notes with Sheikh Hasin because the Rohingya problem affects India as much as it affects Bangladesh. So there is a moment where India could play a major role. I don't think India is shying away from it. But yes, much better role to play than uh, what you can expect the Americans or uh, the Australians. Um. I want to move on to talk about the ceasefire a little bit because I think that's an important aspect of this. Um, uh, many of the ethnic armed organizations have pledged to sort of protect protesters, um, whereas there are some like the Iraq Army that have been delisted from being a terrorist organization. Uh, so what, as Mr. Heblicker, you described uh, Myanmar to be a horseshoe, right? So how... Do you see the ceasefire holding up? How do you see relations between the Myanmar military and uh, ethnic groups across the country? Okay, so let's begin with a little bit of perspective. You know, in the mid 80s, uh, Tang Xiaoping inaugurated what I popularly call a look south policy. That is opening up Yunnan province or uh, trying to bring about development in its least development provinces, Yunnan and two other provinces, uh, received attention. And Yunnan's province, was to be linked with Myanmar. And Yunnan province was to be given access to the sea. I thought it has been the Chinese designs to get into the warmer waters of the <coughs> Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean, is just like a palm with five fingers. They want to get into the sea. And here was an opportunity that Tan Shopping was looking at, using uh, Myanmar as a transit route, uh, then Burma, a transit route into the Bay of Bengal and onwards to the uh, Indian Ocean. And that's how they brought about, they told the Communist Party of Burma that time has come for you to, you know, take a back seat. Allow us to do, I'm sure uh, Bertil will give you all the, the finer details of it. But between 1988 and 1990, they brought about 16 armed groups. It was the very famous, they called General Kinyun's word, who was the head of the intelligence <coughs> as exchanging arms for peace. It was to create peaceful conditions in the area where this transit corridor was to come by. So, but there have been problems. Like I said, the horseshoe has people who don't see eye to eye. They've had problems in the first uh, uh, Panglong conference and now they continue to have these problems. Because I think the trust levels between them and the Myanmar authorities are not to the extent that they will be able to move ahead because that is one of the intractable problems that we have seen. Why is a ceasefire uh, between uh, the, the the government and the ethnic organization necessary, economic development all per se? Yes, but the transit route which China is planning will have to go through those areas which are currently in conflict zones. So as what General Mion Ling said last year, that the Arakanis had been paid by the Chinese for peace to ensure that its project goes through was something of a revelation. It's some, it was new because uh, such uh, statements have not been publicly made. But I think that was the reason why he blamed the Chinese for harming the, the Arakan National Army. Actually, the problems began in Arakan in, 2000, in 2016. I happened to be in Rangoon when we used to hear reports about <clears throat> the military action in uh, the Rakhine state against the insurgents. And ARSA, I think that was one of the organizations that fought up. And there were the fears that, you know, some of the remnants of the 
Islamic uh, theorist organizations would find shelter here and create a bigger sanctuary for themselves. So I think as far as the ethnic problem is concerned, I think uh, there has not been much of movement. Like I said, the Kachins are a very proud race. They sit on one of the most prosperous properties in uh, northern Myanmar. Then you have the Shans, you have the Kerens, the Kains, and then you have the Mons. And on our side of the border, you have the uh, Arakanis and the Chins. So I think uh, given the mix, the interfaith mix, the outlook, uh, they've not been able to find that right kind of uh, opportunities to take the ceasefire forward. The fact that the military has uh, delisted the uh, the Arakan the Arakan armed groups is something that wants it has already entered into some kind of an agreement with them. So don't make things messy for us. We are already facing the heat. So I think uh, in the next couple of weeks we know in what direction we are going. Some of the Arakan National Party members of uh, Parliament designate or others who had been arrested have only released. Those who are supporting the the military and who are in the boondocks have now been released and pardoned. So I think this is a new phase and we'll have to see how it goes. But as far as the ceasefire is concerned, I think it's going to be a long time in happening. And it may not be a very, um, uh, you know, um, for say a, a very productive development if it happens very soon. But the change is interested. That's how they keep the United War State Army one of their proxies um, so that, you know, they can take care of its interests. They say the UWSA is sometimes even more uh, militarily well organized, uh, much uh, hardware wise than the Burmese army. So I think I'll rest my thing here. You have a man who's sitting just next door in Chiang Mai who observes everything on a daily basis to leave it to the expert to tell us what is happening. Well, uh, I don't think anyone really knows, knows what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me say something about the ceasefires. I mean, you often hear that there are 10 groups signed in the nationwide ceasefire agreement, but you must remember that most of the groups are very small and not really that important. Uh, the main ethnic armies, like the United States State Army and the KIA, have not signed and are unlikely to do so. The KIA is somewhere in between hard and the rock place. I mean, they, they are dependent on China for you know, goods coming across from the, from the Chinese side, you know, food. Uh, petrol, medical necessities, and that sort of thing. Not weapons. They get some from the war, but not directly from China. But the Chinese are very suspicious of the Kachins. Because, you know, you know, Gunmo went to America, invited by the Baptist Church in America. And uh, when uh, the government found out about that, they were, and the Chinese authorities found out about that. They were furious, of course. And I think they had something to do with one more being pushed out of the organization a couple of years ago. But the relationship with the war is more straightforward, but not quite as simple as one might think. So I visited the war area in 2019 at the invitation of the war, and they traveled extensively in the area under their control. But you, you think you're in China, because they use the Chinese currency, the mobile phones are Chinese, Internet heavily censored is Chinese. You cannot get Facebook unless you go VPN and so on and so forth. And the language of Franca there has now become Chinese. When I was there during when the same manner, it was controlled by the Communist Party of Burma. It was Shan because there was the, the language spoken in the village level between wars from different tribes who don't speak mutually intelligible dialects. But after that visit, I wrote a book about the war. I'm not trying here to advertise my books, but <laughs> I just want to mention this as an example that this is not quite as simple as uh, one might think. Uh, it's a book about the war called uh, The War on Myanmar and China's Quest for Global Dominance. And uh, it's in English, naturally. And I sent a couple of copies to a, a trusted war con uh, contact. And I thought, I was wondering, what are the war going to say about this? And my great surprise, they liked it. And they're now talking about having the book translated into Chinese and printed at their own printing press in Pangsan. So I was wondering there, what is this going to do to war Chinese relations? Because I outlined the very difficult and troubled relationships the war had with, it, with the Chinese for, for, you know, for centuries. And uh, my only conclusion is that I write certain things there if the war cannot say themselves, especially about China. But my conclusion there is that there may be Chinese puppets 
and no tiny studios. And with a more clever policy towards the war, and that's just the dismissal of drug traffickers like the United States and Australia do. That's ridiculous. Yes, they've been involved in the drug trade, but who in Burma has not been involved in the drug, drug trade in one state or in one in a point of time or another? And they, I think the war actually will welcome contacts with forces, individuals, groups, other than the Chinese. But the question how this can be done is this not an easy thing because they're right up there on the Chinese border. And they're, they're on the Thai border as well, but there's a different kind of setup. But I think when we have to look at, and, and they were not going to sign a ceasefire. I asked uh, the head of um, the Foreign Relations Department if they were going to do that. And he said, no, no, we're not going to sign a political agreement, politically binding ceasefire agreement before we reach a political agreement. And that agreement would be, you know, a separate war state inside the Union of Myanmar. That's what he, he said. But then again, I mean, the world feel that they're very different from the rest of the country, much more than any of the other ethnic minorities. I mean, the, the only part of the country that's never been controlled by any central government. The British never controlled it. They had some flag marches once in a while. After independence, it was controlled by the Kuomintang warlords and by the Communist Party and over the United West State Army. And when there were peace talks in Nipido in 2017, I was there, a big de war delegation came but 30 of them, they had a new waistcoat on with a buffalo on the back. And they sat down and listened to the, to the proceedings. But I found out that in that group, only one could understand Burmese, or the Myanmar language. And there was Shaguan, who is Chinese, from China, <laughs> who came as a volunteer and joined the Communist Party in 1869. The one just sat there as a show of force. But they didn't understand or speak a word of Burmese. <laughs> but naturally, they were, they're very different from all the other groups. But again, I'd like to emphasize that one should have a much more open mind when approaching a group like the one. They're not just Chinese puppets, they're not just drug traffickers. They're more than that. So do you think that the coup is going to make tensions between ethnic armed organizations and the military worse? It's happening already because the, all these groups that signed this national ceasefire agreement have thrown it out and say, we're not talking to this government. And uh, also... MPs and others who escaped from the urban areas, as you know, many of them are in Mizoram, but uh, they also a lot on the Thai border and don't cross into Thailand, but are in areas controlled by the Korean, the Korean National Union, and uh, with RCSS, the Restoration Council of Shan State. But uh, these groups, uh, which have since very famous with the government, the only two major groups really, are all decided with uh, movement, whatever you want to call it. But how that is going to play out over the year, next year or two years, is way too early to say. It can change rapidly. Anything can happen. Mr. Hebricker, do you have anything to add? Do you agree? Do you disagree? No, I think uh, some few weeks ago, some leaders of the ethnic uh, national organizations did send out the word that um, they would walk out of the talks with the government. Uh, till such time uh, they create conditions suitable to talk. I think um, they have um, given effect to it. And now there have been a lot of reports coming that they would like to invite uh, anti-government or shall we say pro-democracy uh, pro, pro elements to come and stay with them. They'll give them all the protection that is necessary. I think to that extent, um, in this uh, chaotic situation, no ethnic national organization would like to throw its lot to the government because I don't think it is very sure as to how much the military would cede uh, by way of concessions in uh, peace talks. And the peace talks, in any case, are based on a national platform rather than on a bilateral basis with the military. So to that extent, I think uh, we are seeing uh, difficult conditions from the ceasefire point of view. And if ceasefire continues to be, a, uh, to be observed more in breach than in uh, practice, then there will be tensions between the military and the armed groups. That's how they still continue to bear arms under the agreement. So nothing can be said that uh, whether there could be a fist fight or a fire fight between the two sides. All right. Uh, I know that we are not in the business of crystal gazing, but what do you think people should be watching out for over the next couple of weeks or months with how the situation is evolving in Myanmar? 
I've been listening to all sorts of pundits saying all sorts of things over the past few weeks. And they mentioned, for instance, the Philippines, 1987, when the army split and Marcos had to flee the country. That is not a valid comparison. Of course, first of all, there's a vast difference when it comes to discipline and organization between the Philippine military and the Myanmar Tamado. And secondly, in the Philippines, you had the American factor. They could step in and tell Marcos, get out of here, the game is over, right? Then some people have mentioned uh, Indonesia and Indonesia's transition to democracy. Yeah, well, it's more valid than the Philippines, but still, it's not the same thing, because in the, even in, the, in, the, in the Indonesia, and I was there during the fall of Suharto, the government and uh, the, the head of the military, General Varanto, had all turned against Suharto and said, it's time for you to retire, time is up. And we don't want to make any drastic changes, so it happened gradually. And that situation is not what we're seeing in, in, in Myanmar at all. And then you have Taiwan. But Taiwan, yes, it became a flourishing democracy. It has to be the China factor again. It had to be different from the China. They couldn't not maintain an authoritarian Kuomintang kind of dictatorship in Taiwan and expect to get international support and sympathy. And then you have South Korea. And in 1979, the South Korean strongman, dictator, some pe people would say, Park Chung-hee, was assassinated by uh, the head of South Korea's intelligence, the KCIA. And they came after several years of student unrest and demonstrations and so on. And he knew what was going to happen to him. He sacrificed his own life to save the nation. Of course, nothing changed overnight. It, they had to go through the Kung Chu massacre and so on, but eventually, South Korea saw the transition to you know, modern functioning democracy. But again, there you have the American factor, the US basis in South Korea. It's strategically extremely important. It was in America's interest to see some kind of stability in the country. And it was clear that uh, Park Chung hee couldn't, couldn't provide them with that. So there is really no model in the region that Burma could follow. And that is why it's, the situation is so difficult to predict. I mean, a split in the military could change things, but is it happening? There's no signs of that whatsoever. But the Tamadou remain remarkably united. Whether they talk, what they talk about among themselves, we don't, we don't know. But there's no signs that they're actually you know, about to break up into different factions. The police, yes, you have about hundreds of policemen who joined the civil disobedience movement. They are under the control of the military through the Ministry of Home Affairs, but it's still not the military. So I would, I would actually argue since 1988 that unless and until segments of the military decided that time is right for change, for real change, nothing is really going to happen. Nothing is really going to change, unfortunately. I wish I could give you another answer, but that's my conclusion. Right. Mr. Hebliger? The uh, short end of it, I would like to see um, the dispensation in Myanmar with Burmese characteristics, that they evolve a system where they are going to be comfortable with. A few weeks ago, the Philippines uh, Foreign Secretary made a two-minute statement to officers of his uh, ministry, and he was very clear. He says that as uh, long as uh, Myanmar has to remain united, it is the military which will call the shots. And he said, and he also had some harsh words uh, against the Aung San Suu Kyi uh, establishment, equally as well against the American influence. And he repeatedly told his officers, if anybody is hobnobbing with the Americans vis-a-vis -vis Myanmar, they're going to face his wrath. So as far as the countries that we looked at which could provide Myanmar a model to fashion itself upon, I think... Uh, ASEAN is not the right place to be looking at. Because if you look at ASEAN's you know, style, its construction, all of them have either come from one particular uh, area of governance, of very strong governance. Which are the countries which you, we would like to, you know, uh, say Myanmar should be looking at in a more uh, mature fashion. Uh, a large number of Indian uh, academics have been visiting uh, Myanmar to talk to politicians, to talk to academics, 
about uh, constitution and democracy and things like this. And we have a university in my hometown whose vice chancellor that visited that place a large number of times. And uh, I think he uh, was along with uh, Bertil at um, Tashishila Institution's uh, deep webinar on Myanmar. And he mentioned about what was in the minds of the Myanmar, uh, you know, uh, people that they would look at something akin to India, not like India, akin to India, where the states and the territories share power with the central government. That's one. But here, how do you accommodate the military? In India, it's very well known, the military does not play a role beyond what is ordained by it in the constitution or by the political leadership. How do you get the military in Myanmar to agree to this? I think that's a question that you need to have a, you know, a round table conference about. What are the military's predilections? Why should the military continue to renew itself in power? There is no military coup, only one military coup took place. It's named, brought Navin to power. And there has been no coup by the military against itself. It's been all, they have been trying to renew themselves in power. The only time we knew that there were divisions within the SLORC and SPDC was during the time of General Khanshwe, where Lieutenant General Tinu and Lieutenant General Kinyur were, were regarded to be on the opposite sides. And General uh, Monge, the commander in chief of the military, the head of the armed forces, he was the third power center. We don't know what exactly is the power center in today's organization. And the fact that um, the general has abrogated uh, his own constitution, so to say, to take power from a civilian government speaks a lot about what the military mindset is. If you look at election results over the 1990 and 2015, uh, NLD swept office by 80 to 85% of the votes which means that 80 to 80 percent of the military voted for pro-democracy. The feeling for pro-democracy is there, but how does it get articulated or translated remains to be seen. But I think uh, there requires to be a strong amount of pressure on the military in Myanmar in one way or the other. I don't know how to you know, construct this pressure, but you need to discuss. If you don't, then I think uh, the military is not going to be anywhere even near Taiwan when it comes to governance. We need to develop this country. You look at some of the things that are floating in uh, social media about the huge money the generals have made, it's mind boggling. You can build a road from here to the moon, I guess, with all the dollars put in between. So I think there is a case that you need to understand that what are the military's predilections? What are the guarantees it requires? Does it require a group of people to talk to it? And what are the assurances that are given in the bargain? Plus, you need to understand that the military has created a political vacuum in the country. Aung San Suu Kyi is no politician. She was there thrust into limelight by, you know, by force of uh, actions that were happening. There. No politicians are the way we have in our country. So I think we are looking at a political vacuum, which none is able to, you could have smart politicians. I think there are a large number of things that we need to address. I think the first and the foremost is, which way is that country headed today? Can it afford more bloodshed? Can it afford an economic slide back? They were required to be growing at 8% this time. At what is the COVID situation all about? So I think we are looking at uh, some, uh, some situation which we cannot put a you know, point at this point of time. I think next couple of weeks, the country is really uh, going to be uh, you know, creating problems for its neighborhood. All right. Um, this is my last question for the both of you. Mr. Hebliker, we can start with you. What are books or resources you think people should be reading if they want to understand more on of Myanmar? The, the first of the clutch of books which Bertle has written. The Land of Jade, that would be a good textbook to read for people to understand. There are a lot of books on India's Northeast that, you know, India's Northeast and Myanmar, Bangladesh have a lot of familial relationships, cultural relationships. So we need to understand. Then the third important is to read about the, the Buddhist Sangha in uh, Myanmar. 
how the monks play a leading role, what are their big contributions to their country. Then there are a large number of books written by uh, people on Burmese social history, Burmese political history, for example, what tales the Rohingya community? Why is it that you know we have uh, not many people who can talk on this subject without uh, wearing you know colored glasses? Things like this. For example, what I read and I read ten times more is a book written by Field Marshal Slim. It's called the the uh, Forgotten Army. It was a book which is prescribed in the National Defense Academy in Kadakwasta. And anybody who reads this book understands what uh, Burma is all about. So these are some of the books that need to be written. And uh, you also need to understand the communist philosophy because, you know, Asia has been home to most of the largest communist parties in the world. Communist Party of China and the former Communist Party of Soviet Union. Then you have the Communist Party of Vietnam. You have Burmese Communist Party. What are the relationships? What are the fashion people's thinking and things like that? But yes, if anybody looking at the strategic compulsions of understanding uh, Burma, please read Field Marshal Slim's book. It's a thick book, about 600 pages, I think. It gives you a whole host of uh, ideas, maps, and why a particular place, uh, Swebo, why is it considered to be a good tankable country where armored units can fight there? Things like that. It's very, very interesting. And of okay. course, if you, are, if you are in the UK, go to the British archives, read about the boundary problems between Thailand and uh, British uh, Burma. You know, there were problems between the two countries on the border side. There is a young researcher in uh, UK called uh, Avinash Paliwal. He's in the School of uh, Asian Oriental Studies. He writes a lot about the school. I mean, some of these things you could have a look at. But of course, the master is the one who will tell you what books you've got to read. <laughs> All right, Mr. Lentner, that's your cue. Well, I uh, actually brought a couple of books here. And uh, the one I would strongly recommend is called Making Enemies, War and State Building in Burma, Mary Callahan. It's about the evolution of the Burmese military from independence until the coup in 1962. Mary Callahan is a Burmese speaker. She's right now, she's spent several years in Burma, and I think she's still there, teaching uh, among other, other audiences, the military. And she is a specialist on the Myanmar military. She knows what about the way they function, the way they think than anybody else. And they are the Westerner, I would say. And then you have this one, as you see, I'm concentrating on the military, eh? the most important institution in the country. <laughs> Burma's armed forces, power without glory, of Andrew Self. It's more factual than analytical. It's a lot about uh, the history of the military, how the military is organized, orbits, and that sort of thing. But still, highly recommend it. And then we have this one. Strong soldiers failed revolution. The state and military power Burma, 1962 to 1988, by uh, Yoshihiro Nakanishi, is a Japanese researcher. This one is excellent because it goes down to local administration throughout the country, but the military even controlled that. It makes it, it was not just a centralized military leadership in the, in the capital, but throughout the country, every you know, county, whatever you want, every, you don't call them the counties in Burma, they call them you know, districts and townships, and how the military sees definite, absolute control of, of, of 1962. Even, this is important to remember, there were a lot of military coups in the early 60s, uh, late 50s and so on, but normally militaries were content with seizing political power. Uh, political power. Uh, they, they never seized economic power. In Thailand, when I were tired of coups here, yeah, at the time military has entered in a, a very early stage into marriage convenience with the Sino-Thai business community. The same way Soharto in Indonesia, the Sino-Indonesian plutocracy became its supporters. And the military seized power in, in, in Myanmar, Burma in 1962, and seized economic power as well. There was the Burmese road, the way to, the road to socialism. It was not socialism like in, you know, Eastern Bloc and that sort of thing. It was a peculiar kind of socialism. Everything was naturalized, and placed under about 23 state corporations controlled by the military. And then when you had this exodus, about 200,000, 300,000 people of Indian origin. Well, they said they owned everything they owned, everything was, was confiscated and nationalized. 
Well, if the Mermis military at that time had entered into similar marriage convenience with the Indo-Burmese and the Sino-Burmese, I think the country would be quite prosperous today. But instead, this decided on seizing economic power. It was stupid, to, to be frank. Military guys cannot run economies. This doesn't, this doesn't work. And the, then the last one is this, which is not actually for Dale. It's an academic uh, thesis, Left, Lieutenant Colonel James McAndrew, who is an American army officer. He was a defense attaché in, in Myanmar for a couple of years. It's, it's called From Combat to Karaoke, Burmese Military Intelligence, 1948 to 2006. This is the only book I've seen which is about the most powerful institution within a powerful military and military intelligence apparatus. But also the books I would recommend. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Lintner and Mr. Hebriker, for joining me today. I was very, very illuminating, and I think we covered a lot of ground. So thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you very much. Wonderful being here. That brings us to the end of this episode of States of Anarchy. Thank you for staying with us. All of Mr. Lintner and Mr. Hebriker's recommendations are in the episode bio, so do check those out. I've also added some of Bertel's books that I really enjoy, so I'd highly recommend getting your hands on them. If you have questions or comments about Myanmar in particular or foreign policy in general, then you can send them across. On next week's episode, I will answer listener questions about international relations. So you can mail me at ivmstatesofanarchy at gmail.com or slide into my DMs on Instagram at statesofanarchy or on Twitter at humsneyh. If you want to show us some support, send this episode to someone who you think may enjoy it. You can also leave us a rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. If you want to be even more involved, check out our Insta page where we post regularly about foreign policy and even quizzes where you can check out how much you know about the world. You can listen to States of Anarchy not only on the IBM podcast app or website, but on any other podcast app that you can think of. We'll be back next week. We live in an age of disruption, of immense change in every aspect of work, life and business. But is the old way of doing things truly dead? And are we ever going to stop saying the new normal? Join me, Varun Dugirala, on Advertising is Dead every Tuesday as I talk to entrepreneurs, leaders, creators and change makers from across business, media, marketing and beyond to dig a little deeper into how we got here, what we're doing now and where we're headed. You can catch all the episodes of Advertising is Dead on the IBM Podcast website, app or wherever you get your podcasts from. If you love cricket, listen up. The Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast is here for you. Hosted by DJ, Varun, and me, Ashwin, we bring a fun, fresh fan's point of view to talking all things cricket. Sometimes it's just the three of us, sometimes we have guests, including current and former international cricketers. For new episodes every week, check out the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast on the IBM app, website, or wherever you get your podcasts.